Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I am the Lord that's Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. And if you notice, we get to go to a picnic and it's not hot. So I am excited about that. I hope you are too. Um, It's good to see everybody this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. Um, If you'll see, there's a uh, an attendance code there you can do with your phone. If you'll take out your phone and scan that for us, members as well, uh, we'd like to get a, a record of your attendance. Um, also, if you've not had an opportunity to get the emblem for the Lord's Supper, raise in the back. So if you'll raise your hands, he'll work his way down and he'll make sure that you have that emblem um, for the Lord's Supper. I've got a few announcements this morning. I would, uh, I would say go ahead and pick up, if you get a chance, the announcement sheet that's in the back. It's a full list of the announcements uh, that's coming on for, the, for today. I just want to highlight a few. Of course, our Bear Valley picnic is today at Clement Park. Uh, we're going to start eating at 1230, but I don't know what pavilion number. Does anybody know? J. Pavilion J? J. K? No. J. K. <laughs> J. K. L. Okay. So if you get to one of those, you'll be set. So J. K. L. So we're, we're looking forward to that. And, and just a reminder, there will be no PM services at the building tonight once we we dismiss from there this afternoon. We'll be done for the day. Uh, tomorrow starts the Bear Valley Bob Wentz two classes, and tomorrow will be the first chapel uh, at 10 a.m. Everyone's invited to attend that if you would like to. Um, the new member and student reception will be Sunday, August 13th, following the evening services, and everyone is invited to attend. Let's remember that the Mountain States Children's Home Summer Food, food Drive is August 13th, and we want to pack the pulpit. All the items are going to be brought to the stage next week, but there's a list of what's needed out there. That's a great, that's a great work. Uh, it's a great work that Gerald does in getting all that up there. And I would, I would say if you ever had the opportunity to travel with Gerald to Mountain States to take that uh, to food and see what they've got going on, it really puts into perspective how much help they need, how much they do, and, and how much air support and the local congregations uh, help them. Uh, let's remember we got the men's prayer breakfast. That's going to be August the 12th uh, at 8 a.m. in the fellowship hall. Okay, so this is a little different this year than what we're used to. We're kind of starting a little early. So the annual Bear Valley Family Retreat is going to be November 3rd through the 5th at the YMCA at Snow Mountain Ranch in Granby where we normally have it. If you're new to the congregation, this is a retreat not just for families, but for the church family. So any and all are welcome to attend. This also includes our Bear Valley Bible Institute students. It's a great time for fellowship. It's a great time for growth. And you will be surprised uh, how you'll get to know your fellow brother and sister in Christ after this event. So due to some changes in the, on the YMCA's end, registration and payment this year is under a hard deadline. It's all due October the 1st. So it's a month in advance from what we're normally used to doing. There's also been some small price increases also due to the increases by the YMCA. If you have any questions, please reach out to Carrie or reach out to myself and we can help you with that. Registration has now been opened in Realm and you can pay by a credit card or debit card there or you can pick up registration sheets from the table in the foyer and return that with a check made to the church to either Carrie or myself, and we'll get you, get you registered. And we hope to see everyone there. It's a great time, and, and we look forward to it again this year. 
as we start this call to worship and we, we focus our minds, I'm going to read from Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Let's worship together. If it's convenient for you, please stand for this next song. In heavenly armor,
Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this beautiful day which you have given us. Lord, we are so grateful for the rain that you have sent our way, the cooler weather that you have also sent our way. Lord, we are grateful for your creation that you have given us to enjoy. Lord, thank you for this time where we're able to gather together to worship you, to sing praises to your name. Lord, we ask that we take the classes and the lessons that we hear here, that we hear today, we apply them to our heart and we apply them to our lives as we go throughout this week in our lives. Lord, we ask that you be with those who are on our sick and prayer list. We ask that you be with each of them and in their individual needs. Lord, we thank you for your son and his willingness to go on the cross on our behalf. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen. To set our minds on the Lord's Supper, let's sing Lamb of God. Mm. Your only Son. If you're visiting with us, again, we are so happy that you're here, and uh, this is a very special time in our worship service. Of course, every aspect of it is special, but a time now in which we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper, and so if you did not receive the emblems upon your entrance into the auditorium, raise your hand, and we'll have someone, okay, we have a few here, and I'll bring those down to you. Just keep your hand up if you don't mind, and they'll bring those here. When we partake of the Lord's Supper each first day of the week, if you're like me, I, I think about, well, what is it that I can focus on better? What can I do better? What is it that will allow me to enhance this part of the worship service? And, and sometimes it may be that I'm going to close my eyes and just look down and, and free myself from all distractions, but then, you know, 
the things of the world maybe sometimes begin to creep in. And if you're like me, I have a little hard time concentrating sometimes. And, and so maybe I, I think about sermons that we've heard that encourage us to maybe look around and to see our fellow saints or to, to look up uh, near the front and maybe there's some sort of uh, a picture on the wall or something like that that might encourage us. I want to share with you something that uh, I, I read not long ago that uh, gave me one more opportunity to enhance this part of the worship service for myself, and, and that is to think about what is it that we look at when we are partaking of the Lord's Supper. Metaphorically, I want us to think about a, a few things. This morning, I want you, first and foremost, to look up, to look up. Now, that may be literal in the sense of thinking about God is above us, that he's everywhere, that he is greater than us. But as we partake, let's look up and think about the nature of who God is. And as you progress through the book of Romans, that's exactly what Paul does first and foremost, is emphasize the very nature of God, both his goodness and his severity, reminding us that God is righteous and he can't ignore wrongdoing. In fact, wrongdoing has made him angry, and so he must pour out his wrath upon injustices. But the Bible also teaches us that God is a God of love and goodness and mercy. And so as I look up this morning, I want to think about God. And when I think about God, that causes me to want to look within. Because in God's presence, I see my sinfulness. I see my need for salvation. I see my need uh, to understand that I can't in and of myself and by myself somehow restore fellowship with a holy, powerful, sinless God. And so then that causes me to look back. And as Paul then progresses through the book of Romans, reminding us that God is no respect of persons, that there's no partiality with God, I recognize and understand that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Everyone sitting in this audience this morning that understands what we're talking about can hear my voice and, and process that. The so-called, past the so-called age of accountability, folks, we all stand at level ground on the foot of the cross. We're all sinners. And it's such a joy to think about what happens here the equalizing, as it were, of every one of us, and whether we have a lot of money or we don't, or whether we're highly educated or not, or whether we come from some other part of the world, it doesn't matter that as we look within ourselves this morning, we recognize that we're all sinners in need of salvation, that apart from what Jesus did, and looking back now to the cross as the third thing in terms of looking back, I recognize and understand that Jesus paid the price for my sins, for your sins. I look back to the scenes of Calvary and what took place in that city of Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago at Golgotha. The sacrifice, the penalty, the price that was paid to satisfy the justice of God. He took our place there. And then that causes me to look around and to see a restored fellowship with God, but also with humanity, but especially within the church here in this congregation. We're a family. And I'm not saying that you have to, that it's wrong to close your eyes and to look down and concentrate. Everybody has to do, I guess, what is going to help them focus on these things the best. But I appreciate 1 Corinthians and what it teaches us about the nature of fellowship and our coming together and what we do as a collective body of Christians. This is a time of celebration. This is a time of one anothering. This is a time of joy. Yes, it's a time of reflection and sorrow, thinking about what Jesus had to do for us, but we've gained the victory. And as God's family, we are now going to collectively partake in a memorial feast reminds us of the cost of sin, the blessings in Christ, and the hope of eternal salvation, and the joy of being a Christian. Let's uh, 
have a prayer now as we give thanks for the bread. Father, thank you so much for your son. Thank you for this bread that reminds us of the body of Jesus Christ that was sacrificed on our behalf. In the name of Jesus, our risen Savior and greatest friend, we pray. Amen. Now let us give thanks for the cup. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the sacrifice that you've made. And for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which reminds us of the blood of your Son. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, because we have been able to look up and see God and look within and see ourselves and the need that we have for salvation, because we've been able to look back and see what God did for us some 2,000 years ago at Calvary, and because we've been able to look around and see that we as a congregation have been blessed because we know of salvation, we now have the hope of eternal life, we need to look ahead to not only the glories of heaven, but to look ahead to the responsibilities that we have in sharing the good news of Jesus. The collection that we are now going to participate in, the gathering of funds, is for the preaching of the gospel, for the help that is needed in edifying the church and taking care of those who are in need. And with our collection this morning, then, we are truly looking ahead to the things that are truly most important and the spiritual needs that others have. As you can see on the overhead, there are several ways of giving, but to facilitate our thinking about this wonderful act of worship, we're going to be singing a song as we then take up this collection.
is the victory. In Kansas, along the hills of mighty Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glory skies. Against the foe and nails below, let all our strength be heard. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Scripture reading is familiar to most, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Thank you, Dean. Good morning, church. It's good to see you. Good to share this time of worship and fellowship. It's going to be great to share a meal with you later when we gather for that picnic. It's just good to have God's family here. Good to be part of this family. Curious, have you ever seen these kinds of devices before? Yes. All right, so for those of you that need help... It's these. <laughs> these are um, familiar to most people. These are uh, hand strengthening devices. So one, you, you, you know, this one right here is probably the one you see on a lot of people's desks at work because we think about them. And yes, they strengthen my hand, but it's a great stress relief, right? When you're sitting there. <laughs> but this this one works. You you do do a couple of different things. You squeeze this one, and it works forearm right here. This one's actually one I found a, a couple of years ago. And it's it's kind of neat. It's the one on the, the blue one on the screen. This is one that you slip on your hands, and it works a different set of muscles. Works your fingers really well. And as you as you stretch this out, instead of catching this forearm, it catches the top side of that. And it's kind of neat. You know, it, it, these are all meant. Here you go, Dallas. I'm gonna let you hold on to this. Work on this for a little while, and then we'll arm wrestle later. <laughs> these are all meant to bring about uh, an increase in one's Grip strength. Grip strength is described as 
someone's ability to hold on to something without it slipping, without it hitting the ground. Uh, or, or grip strength is, is what we talk about when you can hold on tight enough to something in order to get a job done. And it's one of those traits that in, has, has lost a lot of importance in recent years. And I think part of that is that our, our, the kinds of jobs that we hold have shifted an awful lot. We used to need grip strength a lot with jobs we used to work, but nowadays most of us uh, or, or the great majority of us have, have jobs that require soft skills, if you will. All right, we're, we're sitting at desks and we're typing on, on keyboards and all those different things. And, and so there's more and more of us need those soft skills. But historically, grip strength has been a really important skill for an awful lot of people. You think about lifestyles and jobs that people had. Farmers, I mean, everybody's seen farmers' hands, right? My, my dad grew up on a dairy farm. And to this day, even though he hasn't been on that farm in... Oh, I don't know how many decades. It's been a long time since he's been on that farm. My dad has, has hands that are just the meatiest things. I've never been able to hold. I'm scared. Like my dad's 60-something. I still won't hold my hand up to my dad's because I don't want to see how much bigger his hand is than mine. But, you know, farmers have needed to have that strength. You go onto loading docks and shipyards and, and even truckers, you know, people that have to use their hands regularly. That, that's been part of that's been part of their life is to have that strong grip strength. For more times nowadays, we don't think about it in terms of, of jobs. We think about it in terms of recreation a lot more now. Have you, has anybody here ever done rock climbing? Yeah, you're crazy. Uh, <clears throat> Rock climbing, you can see in that third picture there, you know, it's where people are, you know, they're going up the side of a cliff and, and whatnot. And so they've got the ropes. And so they have to have really, really strong fingers and, and grip strength to be able to not fall to their death, right? And, and, and then even, but even some of our more traditional sports, baseball and golf and whatever else, when you have to grip a hold of something, you need a good grip strength. And so when we understand it, and the idea is that whatever field you might find yourself in needing a good grip strength, it, if you need it, but you don't have it, you learn the consequences very quickly. If you are a rock climber and you don't have a good grip strength, you're not getting very high off the ground. But if you happen to be a farmer or a construction worker and you don't have a very good grip strength, you're going to find that elements of your job are not going to get done very well. Or you're going to have to have an awful lot of other pieces involved to help get that done. And, and you may struggle to do, your, uh, to do your job adequately. The reason why I bring this up this morning is because most of us in this room are painfully aware that the modern church in the United States has, is suffering from what I'm going to call a grip strength problem. We're having a harder and a harder time than at least we have ever known of holding on to members inside of the Lord's church. We're seeing an ever-increasing number of souls who are choosing to walk away from the Lord's church. And oftentimes, they're walking away from faith altogether. And we've heard about the studies. We've seen some of the numbers. This comes from a Pew Research in 2019 that showed that uh, there are 71% of people identify as Christian, and that's Christendom at large in the United States. But on the right-hand side, you see that number 23%. That's 23% of people who are religiously unaffiliated. We've created a category, they're called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, the nuns. They have no religious affiliation whatsoever. And in the last decade, the nuns have been the fastest growing, quote unquote, religious group, if you will, fastest growing demographic in our country. You look at our youngest active generation right now, Generation Z, it's interesting and startling and troubling that Generation Z, 13%. 13% of Generation Z identifies as a nun, religiously unaffiliated. 14% of them identify as atheist, which means that 27%, one quarter of our youngest active generation doesn't want anything to do with religion. 
Now, again, that's Christendom at large. There are some studies that have indicated that what we would call conservative groups, like Churches of Christ, are faring a bit better. But the truth is we're not immune. And even whether you're looking at Christendom at large or you're looking within our fellowship, the truth is the same. The point's the same. Compared with the history of Christianity in this country, our grip strength on the souls who have come to Christ is growing weaker and weaker with each passing decade. So what are we supposed to do about it? This morning, we're going to begin a study that we're going to call increasing our grip strength. In which we're going to examine this question, this problem from, from a macro perspective. Okay, we're going, to, we're going to get the bird's eye view of this thing. And, what, and our goal is that we want to try to improve our ability to hold on to the souls that God has put in our charge. But as we talk about that, um, it, it's going to lead us into a conversation saying, Okay, what, if we the church are trying to hold on to these souls, what should we be doing? What should we be focusing on? What should be the, the things that we are emphasizing that are going to help us hold on to them along the way? And in the study, we're, we're not going to necessarily get into specific strategies. I, personal opinion, I think Bible classrooms and, and other meetings are better places to talk about strategies. But we are going to be talking about some fundamental principles that we see in the Bible to increasing that grip on people's souls that apply to, to every demographic. It doesn't matter if we're talking about young people. It doesn't talk, matter if we're talking about middle age. It doesn't matter if we're talking about the old people. These are principles that are going to be universal, that are going to be across the board, that are applicable. Now, I will tell you that tentatively here in about three weeks, Brett is going to come. Brett will give us some discussion that's going to aim specifically at, our, at keeping our youth. What can we do to increase the grip strength on our young people? But as we start this study, as we get into this today, I, I want us to consider a little bit the concept of just simply holding on. Specifically, as we work to hold on to souls, what exactly are we wanting them and each other to hold on to? that will keep them at church, that will keep them faithful to the Lord all through their lives? And I think this is a really important question that we need to be asking. If for no other reason than in the way that human communication often goes, what we say and what we mean and what is heard are not always the same thing, right? And so as Christians, as the church, we need to make sure that we understand what the proper basis is for staying faithful, for staying in a faithful walk with God. And when we understand that, it's going to impact how we communicate why people should be staying at church. And if we're not clear on that, then it becomes harder to have a strong grip on those souls. And so with that in mind, let's take take just a moment, and I want you to think with me here for a bit. What are some of the reasons, what are some examples of reasons that people have to hold on to church that may not be sustainable? What are some of the motivations that people keep coming back week after week and month after month that if you really analyze it might not be the right reason for you to be coming and it may not be something that's going to keep you coming for the rest of your life. I think I can think of a handful, you know, what are some reasons that people hang on? I, I think one reason that some people come to church and hold on and they're coming to church is because it's, it's culturally appropriate. Meaning that the culture that you are a part of dictates that everyone's expected to go to church because that's what we do. And you think about it in in, in a very real sense, this idea of going to church, being Christian, has become synonymous with American life since before we were even a country. Even though I must admit that it may not carry quite as much weight as it once did. Well, we've heard the phrases, right? We've heard the description. Americans like their God, their guns, and their government, right? Why is it that we keep putting 
God in there with it. Why, does those, why do those kinds of descriptions exist? Well, because Christianity has been part of this culture from the very beginning. And even if it, even if it is less of a part of the culture than it was at one point, the, there are the elements of that thinking that still exist within our culture today. Evidenced by the fact that, that even with a lot of people who, who rarely go to church, they won't set foot in a building for 50 weeks out of a year. But there's two days that they'll go. You know what they are? Christmas and Easter. I heard somebody once call, call that mentality the CEO mentality. Christmas and Easter only. But why is that? Why would somebody who doesn't care about God, who doesn't care about church any other time in the rest of the year, why will they come on those two days? Because it is culturally appropriate. It is what they have been told and taught that they are supposed to do because that's what we do here. But then in a similar vein, but it's going to be a little bit more of a microcosm, I think another reason why a lot of people will hold on to church is because of family tradition. Or you might even say family legacy. This is doing the, this is doing the same thing of cultural propriety, cultural propriety, but you're bringing it down to a microcosm. Because the family that you grow up in is a culture in and of itself. There are traditions, there are norms, there are expectations that are in place that you as part of that family are expected to live by because you always have been. And if your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents all went to church, then you were probably raised doing the same thing and it is a tradition and a legacy of Christianity within your family. And what that means then is that there are some people maybe in this room today, that the main reason that you're here is because your family has always come to church and, and, and the truth is, is that you're, you're thinking about it and you're saying, you know what, if I ever quit going to church, then my grandpa would roll over in his grave. My grandma would not be happy with me and if I quit going to church, then my mama would be on me all the time. She'd be hounding me all the time. When are you going to go back to church? When are you going to go back to church? Thus, what winds up happening is that their presence at church is more about family tradition than an actual commitment to God. But I'll give you one more. I think there's some people that hold on to church because of guilt. They come to church because they're terrified of going to hell. And maybe that's a product of how they were raised. Maybe it's a product of some, of some other religious training. Maybe it's a product of, uh, of the tone in which the church that they grew up in gave. But they hold on to church primarily because they just simply don't want God to be mad at them. And if I quit going to church, then God's going to get mad. Now, as I say that, let's acknowledge God expects his people to worship together. Amen? We read it earlier. That was our scripture reading. Let us not neglect the meeting together as is the habit of some. God expects us, has commanded us to gather together as the body regularly to meet and to worship and encourage one another. We know that that is an expectation. But I will say this, oppressive guilt is not meant to be a long-lasting motivation for someone to come worship God. If you're motivated to come to church because you feel guilty all the time, at some point, that's going to lead to resentment and not love. It's going to lead to resentment about God, about his people, about your upbringing. It's going to lead to resentment about all kinds of things, and you're not going to be able to hold on. And frankly, as we look at all of these, none of these, none of these reasons are sustainable and particularly good reasons in themselves for someone to hold on to church. So what would be better reasons? Where would I find them? I've got a good answer. Let's go to Scripture. If I were to open up the Bible, if I were to open up the New Testament and say, okay, what has God shown me that, that when it comes time for me to go to church, what, what should I be holding on to? Because he's not going to say you need to hold on to your cultural propriety. It's not going to say hold on to your family traditions. It's not going to say hold on to your guilt. What is it that God wants us to hold on to 
And what should we as the church be communicating with one another about what it is we're trying to hold on to as we try to hold on to one another? I want to give you three to consider this morning. The first one that we're going to take a look at is that God calls us to hold on to our confession. We see this phrasing in Hebrews 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast. That is to cling to our confession. Now we talked about this idea of the Christian confession in in our study, God's church is one of a kind, a few weeks ago. But this word confession, the word literally means to say the same thing. Or, or to speak the same word. And it's the idea of agreeing to a proposal of some kind. But especially in Scripture, it's not just agreeing to it, but it is committing yourself to this proposal. Letting this idea that you are confessing and agreeing with be something that shapes who you are and motivates what you do. There is a common message and a common premise that unites parties. And when we think about the Christian confession, what is the idea that we as a body are supposed to be holding on to and espousing everywhere we go? Well, the Christian faith is grounded in the confession, the agreement of Jesus' identity and his work. And we can walk through this relatively simply with a handful of verses. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 24, that unless you believe that I am he, you will all die in your sins. Okay, great. Who is he? Well, we go on, we find out he's the son of God. He is the word become flesh. He's the Messiah, the anointed one who came and who gave his life, who, who was buried and who was resurrected on the third day. But as we keep on going, this idea, he says, you have to believe that I am he. We, keep, we see that played out even more in Romans chapter, nine verses, um, chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Paul makes the comment that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. So he's not just someone who came and died and was buried and rose again. He is now Lord. He is the one in charge. He is the governing authority over the world and over our lives. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. And so what are we beginning to find? That this confession is critical. Our salvation is contingent upon this confession. Jesus will echo that in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. He said that everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who's in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. So why should we hold on tightly? Why should we get our good grip strength on this confession? Because experiencing the salvation that Jesus offers is contingent upon whether or not we hold to the agreement in who he is and what he has done for us. And so when the church is trying to keep a grip on souls... We're asking them to keep a hold on the conviction of who Jesus is. And if we lose our conviction of Jesus' identity and work, then we're going to let go of his church. But we also find in Scripture that not only are we to hold on to our confession, but we are told that we need to hold on to our hope. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. I love this word hope. Biblical hope is is defined as a reasonable expectation. Now that's different from the way that we tend to use it in English. In English, it's kind of a a desire, a wishy-washy desire. Okay, is it going to rain today? Well, if you're in a drought, you say, well, I hope so. It's a desire, but, you know, there's no real conviction. That's not biblical hope. Biblical hope is the expectation of an outcome that has evidence, but it hasn't fully been realized yet. 
And in Scripture, as we go through and we talk about our hope as Christians, our hope is the final salvation and glorification with God in Christ, God in Christ in heaven. And we see that. You, know, you look at it, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, and I, I found it interesting that, that I, I didn't realize until today how big of a role the idea of hope plays in the book of Romans. The word hope is used 16 times in the book of Romans. There's only 16 chapters. Hope is all through it. But in Romans chapter 5, uh, in verse 1, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, since we have this salvation, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And because we stand in grace, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And he'll say in verse 5 that this hope does not disappoint now, that, what that basically says is that you're not going to wake up in heaven one day and go, wow, that's anticlimactic. You're not going to be disappointed. You're not going to be let down and say, well, God, I really was expecting more from what you taught me. No. The hope, the expectation of this glorification is something that we are going to love and it's going to meet every expectation. In fact, it's going to exceed every expectation. And he'll talk about it in other places in... Um, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17, 7 through 18, Paul compares the dwindling glory of Moses in the Mosaic Covenant. He compares that to the permanent hope and glory that is found in Christ. In Colossians chapter 1, he talks about how we have the hope, the expectation of heaven. But when you think about this kind of expectation, an, an expectation of this magnitude must be anchored in something or someone very, very reliable. If you're going to be that convinced of a future outcome, you better have something good to anchor that in, right? Which is why if you, if you were to go back to Hebrews chapter 6, the verse we referenced here a little bit ago, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 7, 17 and 18. If you're not aware, the book of Hebrews is written to a group of Christians who are losing their grip strength on their faith. They're letting go and they're moving back toward that Judaism that, that presumably they came from. And so the Hebrew author is saying, no, you need to hold fast. You need to hold, increase that grip. Don't let go. And so he's given them reasons why they need to hold on. And in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, he says, So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. God wanted you and me to be so confident in this hope that he swore an oath against his own nature. Could you do that? Folks, you can't get more reliable than the nature of God. There's nothing more certain. And so because God swore this oath by his own nature, we can be sure that the promise and the expectation of heaven is real. In verse 19, right after this, he will say that this hope is now a sure and steadfast anchor for our future. We have an anchor that keeps the soul, right? We're just saying it. And I want you to think about what happens in life. When, when you know, when you know for certain that your future is secure, there's going to be some great results in your life that happen because of that. For instance, in 2 Corinthians 3, 12 and Hebrews 3, 6, we find that our hope creates boldness and confidence. We can come before God boldly. I don't have to be terrified that he's going to strike me with a lightning bolt every moment. 
But I can also live boldly in life because I know that my future is secure. And then he says that we find in Romans 5, 2 and following, which we read, as well as Romans 12, 12, that we rejoice in this hope. That the idea that my future is secured energizes me to go live life in an excited way. I don't have to be humglum all the time. Yes, there's difficulties, but I can still be excited about life because I know what's coming for me. And then uh, Romans 8, 24 and 25 and Galatians 5, 5, he talks about how we wait patiently for this hope. Are there times that it feels like God's taking a long time to come back? You can nod your head this way because it is. Do you go through seasons of life that are difficult and hard and you find yourself going, God, when is this going to, when is this going to stop? Yes. But when your hope is anchored in the promise of heaven, in the glorification of our, of our bodies and our souls, when that is the knowledge of your future, even though you may be going through the most difficult time you've ever been able to think up in your entire life, you can still wait patiently. Because you know, you know that at some point, God's going to make it right. And everything's going to be fine. And when the church is trying to hold on to souls, it is important and it is appropriate for us to ask one another, what future are you banking on? Because the only future that is anchored in the nature of God is the hope of heaven. A posh retirement can dwindle. Your strength, your good looks, and your power and authority will diminish and will go away. But the expectation of heaven will never fail. But finally, as we wait for that hope to come to fruition, the Bible tells us that we must also hold on to what is good. Romans 12, 9, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. You look at this verse, and, and just a, 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 the simple structure of this verse would, would suggest or indicate that abhorring evil and clinging to good are extensions of what genuine love for one another looks like. And as you go through the next several verses, you'll see a handful of verses in which he will describe in greater detail what it means, or what, specifically what is the good that we're clinging to, and what exactly is the evil that we are abhorring that we're trying to stay away from. But you can even connect this back to chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Because in verses 1 and 2, he talks about presenting our bodies as living sacrifices being transformed instead of conforming to the world and discerning what is good, discerning what is the will of God. And so as you kind of bring all this together, I, I really like what, um, what one commentator said about this. He said, the highly emotional terms, abhorring and clinging, imply a passionate commitment to the objective good of the fellow members of one's congregation. The objective good. You realize what objective good means, right? It means that this is not a matter of my opinion. It doesn't matter. Uh, it, it's not a matter of my experience versus your experience, my thoughts versus your thoughts. It means that there is a standard of what is good and what is right that rises above everything that humanity is. And it is a standard that we can hold on to and we can believe in. But where does one learn of objective good? Where do you learn about the objective standard of what is right to do to your fellow human beings? You don't learn it out in humanist thinking. You don't learn it by, by adopting a live and let live because there's nothing objective about that. Those are all subjective. It can change with the, with the, the, the winds of time. Whatever the culture at large is saying, well, that's become the new humanist, uh, the new humanist standard. That's become the new, that's the become the new truth is relative standard. Whatever everybody's thinking, well, yeah, I'll go along with that. We learn about what is always and objectively good from God. 
We learn about it from our study of His Word. We learn about it and we experience it from being an active part of His church. Letting go of faith to live by secular standards then means that we are also letting go of God's ultimate standards to guide our lives. If you walk away from the church, then you may say, well, no, 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 I I just don't want the church, but I'm going to keep doing everything God wants me to do. No, you're not. No, you're not. Because somewhere along the way, you're you're going to encounter something that conflicts with what you know to be God's standards, and you're going to choose that instead of God. And so when we try to hold on to souls, we are asking them to hold on to the reliable standard from God of knowing how to live and how to act toward our fellow humans. When we look at what the Bible says about what we should hold tightly to, I I hope you would agree that that it's a bit different than the kinds of things that we talked about earlier that often keep people at church. That cultural propriety and guilt and family traditions. Those may have their place. But in themselves, that's not what God's asking for, and they're not sustainable. God didn't create His church as a place to beat down, to stifle, and to oppress. God created his church as a place, as a body, as a family of joy and of healing and security and guidance. And it's sad to think that so many people are walking away from that today. But at Bear Valley, we want to figure out what needs to be focused on. We want to figure out what it is that we need to be doing to help Hold on to those precious souls that God has brought our way. And we want to know how to increase our grip strength. And to help others do the same. This morning it may be that maybe we can help you out a little bit. Maybe you're, maybe you're, you're, you're beginning to let go. And you realize that that hold on your faith in God is not what it once was. Don't go through that alone. Let us help prop you up. Let us help you increase that faith through study and through love and through prayer and interaction with the body of Christ. If you need prayers for help, prayers for forgiveness, you can come here in a moment. We'll be on the front. We can, you can respond publicly. Or if you need to meet privately, you can go to the offices. Or if you need to become a Christian today and start, start that walk and start that hold on Jesus, we want to help you with that too. Don't leave here, don't leave here in a weaker state than you came. Do what's necessary now to be right with God. How can we help? Let us know while we stand and sing.
We'll go ahead and close with our last song, and then if you please just remain seated for a few special announcements that Wes will have. Thank you, Phil. Very good job. And Corey, what a great lesson for us this morning. I couldn't help but think, and most of us probably, if we're honest with ourselves, have done a little bit like me over the years. I was raised up in the church. I've been going to this congregation for over 30 years. And there has been a time or two where it felt difficult to come here. For whatever reason, whether it be personal or whether it be the weather or whatever it is, but I can say without a doubt that every time I came, I walked away saying, I'm glad I came. It gives me an opportunity to be with people who want to be with God. Make note of that sermon today as we go forward in this Bear Valley Church. I want you to do me a favor. If you want to be... um, Someone who is active in the church, just like Corey was talking about. If you want to be someone who can make a difference, then I ask you to do one favor for this church. And that is, we all sit pretty much in the same sections year after decade after decade. Look around a little bit and find the holes that are in the pews. Make note of who usually is there and give them a call. One phone call. You'll do a tremendous service for this church. It'll encourage people like you never thought it could encourage. I have left phone messages and then got very optimistic replies from a phone message. So just take time, look around, see who's not here. If they're on vacation, fine. If they're not, they're going to be encouraged by you. That's something that you can do. Visitors, We're very encouraged by your presence. We have quite a few visitors with us today, some that we've seen. Uh, I'll make note of uh, Catherine Pollard and her plus one who have visited with us this morning. Thank you for bringing some of your cool Kentucky weather for us. We've been suffering in mid-80s for all summer long, so thank you for bringing that with you. It's good to see you guys. I have something here that I want to read to you. It says, to the Bear Valley elders and family, effective today, I will be stepping down as shepherd for the Bear Valley Church of Christ. I do not have the appropriate time to devote to being a shepherd. It is time for a handoff. We have momentum. There is a clear path for the congregation. I look forward to a new journey with the congregation as a member. I love the people here, and I love the church. In Christ, Mike Ripperton. Now... I read it without tearing up, Mike, so that's a plus for me. But if you have paid any attention at all over the years, you know how much Mike has meant to this church and how much Lisa has meant to this church. The good news is they're staying. Okay? That was the first question out of the shoot. Please, you're not, no, they're not going. They're staying. Thank you guys so much 
for all you've done in difficult times over the years, especially throughout the COVID years, for handing off smoothly in transition. We thank you very, very much. That having been said, I need to get to just one or two quick things before we have a closing prayer. One is a reminder that right after this, there will be a picnic at Clement Park. If you don't know where that is, ask someone. We almost all know where that is. If you didn't think you brought anything food-wise or money-wise, you come see me and it'll all be taken care of somehow. Um, I'll send you to Jack for the money portion, but I'll be praying for you and show you where the food portion is. In just a second, after we close out with a prayer, Denny is going to come up and have a quick little announcement as well. Let's pray for the rest of this day. Our Father in heaven, it is with great honor, with great gratefulness in our hearts, in our, science, uh, in our souls, in our minds that we bow our heads to you, but we do it by looking up, as John said, during our communion service and by realizing what joy we as Christians have deep within our soul, what peace comes with that joy, what excitement and what rewards come with that joy in the future. And even now, Father, we thank you for the rewards and the joy that we have on this earth by being part of this family and, th and part of the body of Christ that is worldwide. We want to thank you so much for this church family. It means so much to so many people throughout the world, but to us specifically, Father, to those of us who belong to this particular flock of sheep, thank you. Help us to continue to have faith in you and hope in you as we go forward. At this time, we also want to pray for the blessings of food, that which we'll be eating at the park for lunch. We thank you for providing us with all of those things, but none more than providing us with your son, Jesus Christ and his blood of salvation that we all are joined with. In his name we pray, amen. Our last song had the words, he will come again. And we need to be reminded of that, that there is a greater plan and there is a divine timetable but we also had an excellent lesson from Corey on having a firm grip on that which is important. And so until he comes again, we need to have a grip on the, word of, the work of God and the word of God. And one thing that is exciting about being a part of Bear Valley is being a part of something that is bigger than ourselves. It is a work of God that is that, that which is truly a worldwide work. And this particular Sunday is especially an exciting Sunday for us uh, because it's the first Sunday in which we welcome the new class. But there have been some changes, as most of you know, in the development department, and our brother Tyler King has accepted a position in Oklahoma and has moved and begun his work there. And so there was a, a hole that we needed filled in the development department and uh, fortunately, there was somebody that we already knew and loved uh, that had worked in the development department previously and has a tremendous love for the school, is himself a graduate of the school. Some of you know John Warren, some of you don't, uh, but John is one that lives in the same San Marcos, Texas area. He is an elder of the church, of the university church there. And um, John is one that has continued to, to keep contact uh, with Bear Valley. And when this opportunity in the development department opened up, uh, John was the one that uh, we thought of, talked to, and he has uh, graciously accepted that role. And so I'm introducing John, so John can then introduce uh, the new students that have come in. And uh, we're excited about that. So John, come introduce the new class. Okay, the biggest fear I had was standing up here and then looking up. I had not done this in a number of years. It's going to get a little emotional. Sorry, Denny. What a beautiful, beautiful sight. 
I get to see at this time. It had been many years since I've been up here. Uh, do you all remember that white pulpit that was off center? I remember my senior sermon 2010 being there, probably the last time I, I, I provided a lesson up here. This is a beautiful sight, a beautiful family. And I'm privileged to follow in the footsteps of one of my great mentors, Bill Stewart, Pooh Duke, Corey Sawyers, Tyler King, and to be part of the development uh, group. And I am truly blessed to be once again part of this. I never left, but I did leave, right? I left to go to Texas. Amazing what Texas weather will do. It'll bleach out all your facial hair. <laughs> this is great. And I'm going to ask for all the new students, if you will, I'm going to inconvenience you, but if you would, make your way to the front, sit here in the front pews, and then I'll introduce you and have you come up and turn around. And, but for now, just come on up and make your way up to the front row. No one sits in the front row anymore, so come on, there's, there's space for you. You know, the first time, and I alluded to this a little bit in our orientation back on Friday, that uh, back on June 26, 2005, I don't know if any, any of you remember being here on June 26, 2005, my family and I, that was the day we decided to come and visit Bear Valley for the first time. We knew that it was a 9 o'clock Bible study. But little did I know that that 9 o'clock Bible study was going to break out into a graduation. And that it was so packed down here, we had to sit in that crazy, scary balcony with my little kids, the, the little ones at the time. And during that graduation, and it was impactful, and every gra graduation is impactful, I heard some names with the last name Ashcraft. You all remember Ashcraft, Stephen Ashcraft. And there was a last name of Castle, Eric Castle. And there was a last name of Sabro. Cliff was here graduating that day. Who could not forget the name Blue Crop? This name that will, that will always stick with me. But there was another name of a fella. Uh, Wade Nelson, do you remember that fellow who walked down here and graduated? Wade Nelson graduated here. That was an impactful day. Little did I know that here we are 18 years later. I'll be looking upon 12 wonderful faces of individuals, Christians, coming from all different walks of life, who are eager, thirsting to study God's word even deeper so that in 2025, you'll be graduating. Oh, and you will be graduating in 2025. We're so proud of you. We're so thankful to God for his provision to you through the individuals and the congregations that are likewise trusting in the Lord and providing for your means so that you could be here for two years to study at the at the feet of great men and great ladies so that you too can not only strengthen your grip, but help others strengthen their grip also. So without any further talking here, uh, we will introduce to you the class of 2025. First, we'll start and just as I call your names, come on up and stand up here in front of the uh, in uh, front of the first stair, Ezekiel and Julie Barnes. Ezekiel and Julie Barnes, they come here from Mesa, Arizona. We're so thankful for them being here. Katie and Brian Buzan. Did I get it right even after I asked you? I did good. Buzan, they too are from Arizona, but they're from Tempe. Now, Many of you know that when students come up from Arizona, it's likely that like a Josh Austin or an Evan Totacini have, have a part in that, and, and that is the case and with our Arizona groups too. 
Bobby Eller. Bobby makes his way here from Waco. He's thankful to be drying out from the uh, Texas heat, which I get to go back to, to here in a couple days. Preston Graber. Preston Graber from Nixon, Missouri. But he did say he came here actually from Arkansas, but most of his time was spent in Nixon, Missouri. Mason McDonald. Mason comes to us from Oklahoma City, and we're very familiar with that beautiful pipeline from Oklahoma City uh, that makes its way uh, thanks to many of the Bear Valley grads there. Noah McCarty. Noah McCarty comes to us from Roswell, New Mexico, but also spent time in Oklahoma City. Uh, Chloe Pierman. Is Chloe here? There you are, Chloe. And now, you may not be familiar with the last name, um, but Chloe and Seth, right, uh, just got married on July 8th. Is that right? Well, uh, duly wits. Congratulations. Alex and Savannah Rawson from Martin, Tennessee. And it's a no-brainer who was responsible for bringing you all this way. The Sawyers, of course. And Brandon Tyler. Brandon comes to us from, it says Hera, Oklahoma, and he's with the Choctaw congregation, but he grew up in Las Vegas, and uh, Mark and Krista Bassett, they're, they're familiar with them. But this is your class of 2025, and before we are dismissed, I know there was the official dismissal prayer, I would like to say a prayer for this group, if you would bow with me at this time. Almighty Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day, this day of worship. And Father, as we, we dwell upon the lesson that Brother Corey had provided us about strengthening our grip, Father, we pray a special prayer and blessing upon these 12 who have put their faith and trust in you to come be a part of this Bear Valley family to study at great depths. Lord, we love them. We've loved them already for, for a while since we've known about them. We pray, Father, that their knowledge, their love for you will just continue to grow and that they will continue to be great servants for you in your kingdom. Be with them, Father, as they prepare to open their books, open the Bible tomorrow, and to study your word. Thank you, Lord, for, for blessing us with them being here today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You're official.